to unified conferencing.
Can you adjust the camera? How was the exam? Nick says not too bad. All right, that's good. Then final, we need to kick it up a notch. Yeah, and that's you can thank Nick. I was expecting fewer radio labeling. You were expecting fewer radio labeling? Yes. Yeah, the logic of the of the obsessive radio labeling questions were not because I anticipate all of you to go into radio chemistry, but rather it. Uh, forces you to make disconnections that you wouldn't normally make. So that was the point. It's funny, I was out consulting last week and I'll tell you, the problems I was getting were pretty much straight from this class. A few of them I was just telling them you should take the class. Um, so, like often you take a class, like in college you took calculus or physics and they were like, well, it's not really like the real world when you design rockets, if you take physics, or when you think about market theory, if you take a math, but this class is actually a real world. So uh, the midterm is on purpose made to be something, you know, pretty, pretty difficult, but reflective of real life. So if you can make it through here, you'll do pretty well at a company. And uh, I should also note, there's not a lot of schools in the country that that have a class like this, so it's good for you guys. So today is a topic which you may say, uh, why are we learning this? Probably we're never going to cover oxygen heterocycles like this in, in the real world. Uh, but it actually turns out that pyrones and their siblings are found all over the place. Tons and tons of natural products, signaling molecules, pheromones, and actually in MedChem, you often see them still to this day. Sometimes they're there, but in a hidden way. So we'll see examples today where they're there, but they're transformed to something from which the fingerprint is gone of their presence. Mm. 
Or they could be useful intermediates for diversification. We'll see all this. Okay, so uh, pyrones and all of their siblings, we'll cover all of the compounds shown here from the four pyrone, uh, also known as a gamma pyrone in the old literature. And its aromatic annulated cousin, the coumarin, or sorry, the chromone, and of course the alpha pyrone, which you can benzanulate in a couple of different ways to give you either the coumarin or the isocoumarin. We're going to cover all these heterocycles today. And everything, of course, starts with a prillium. And I believe we did cover a little bit of this already in maybe lecture one. So probably you all remember that a pyrillium itself derives itself from the same disconnection we use when we make pyridines. So you just take a 1,5-dicarbonyl and you dehydrate it. And the oxidation can be there or not. And pyrilliums want to form. Treat them with acid or acetic hydride or something, and it will give you a pyrillium. And if you get a dihydropyrillium, you need an oxidant, and you'll get out your pyrillium. Uh, for example, a, a classic way to make these is to use problem of the day number one, where we take um, some pretty, pretty two small components, mix them together with BF3 and an acid, and you get out the pyrillium salt. So this is problem of the day number one. And uh, luckily, we have a pyrone expert. It's Shao Kun, right? Yeah. Yes. He is our pyrone expert. If you look at the roster, he is the team pyrone, team pyrillium. So we'll be calling on him roughly every 30 seconds today. Um, so maybe he wants to start us off with problem of the day number one, since he already knows the answer to this. He can, he can carry it through rapidly. And don't wait for him. Start thinking what, what the answer might be. You've got some sort of electrophile, presumably, some sort of nucleophile. Uh, there's no oxidant in here, so something strange happens. So let's see what Chalkman does as a first step. Uh, the pen's not working? Just tap the little pen uh, icon. There you go. Right. <coughs> okay, so he's drawing the enol tautomer. chelating that uh, alpha beta unsaturated ketone with BF3. And uh, okay, he's going to do a Michael addition. Forgive you for the um, old iPad, <laughs> but I think we kind of get what you're, what you're saying here. Uh, some sort of cyclization, okay, and that should give us all right. Now, all you have to do is find an oxidant from somewhere. Where are you going to get that from? Oh. Oh, yeah, there's two equivalents. Okay.
bank shot, no? That's great. In the Perillium forms. S similar vein, you can use uh, a certain kind of cation, triddle cation, and you can generate the same. Species. You can do an aldol and then have it cyclize to give you tricyclic perilliums like this. <clears throat> and of course, we have to put requisite radio labeling in here. Now, the remarkable thing about problem of the day number two is that problem of the day number two is using carbon-11, which has a half-life of about uh, 20 minutes or so. So this is a fast reaction. That, uh, they somehow have obtained nitromethane labeled with carbon-11. Don't, don't ask me how. So problem of the day number two, we need a deep thinker to, if you want me to just draw it, with you, you can tell me what to draw, or you can take the iPad. Tucker, looks like you want to just tell me what to do here. Um, do like a Perrin's addition into the acetic hydride. So, what does acetic hydride and acid look like? What does it turn into? Um. Treat that with acid. You said Prinz addition. Yeah. So can we imagine that when we treat this thing with acid, we will get some quantity of that? Reasonable? Yeah. Okay. So let's do the Prinz addition. After elimination of the cation, you're going to get that. And then what do we do? Once more. Do it again. And this, all of them can be here, or it can be here, or it can be there. Doesn't matter. And then what do you want to do, Tucker? Still on step one. Probably cyclize into the. Okay, now we're in step two. Now, what do you want me to do? And take your time. There's no rush. Okay. And do what to it? Add in where? Okay, let's do that. Now what? Still have potassium terpetoxide around. So if we do your electrocyclization, or it can be a proton transfer, cyclization. Happens pretty quick. 
We like that? Don't know another... I don't know a faster or cheaper way that you would make C11 labeled aromatic uh, compound like that. Pretty, pretty nifty. <coughs> okay, so let's talk about... Any questions before we move into pyrone? Pyrone super important molecules found in hundreds if not thousands of natural products. And uh, I'm going to reveal to you the Rosetta Stone of making pyrones. It's very, very complicated. Just add water. That's it. So if we add water to this, I'll, I'll do the first one for you. And then if you want, you can already start thinking about the other ones. So how do you make these things? Well, just add water. And then think about all of the various tautomeric forms and equilibriums of where the olefins can be. So let's move the proton over. Let's think about that as a viable starting point. We can move the olefin over again. That is a viable starting point. <coughs> All of those are perfectly viable disconnections. And all of those are far more easy to make than the corresponding pyrone. So let's practice on some real world ones. So you're not going to have to make pyrone, but you would have to make these types of guys. So if we do the same exact addition to all of these, it works. Here is your first one, and then, happily, Lucas is going to tell us what to do next. Add water. I, I, I've done that already for you. Uh, what I'm asking is, what now? Does that reveal a, a, a useful disconnection for you? Or do you want to do another tautomeric form first? I guess I want to tautomerize. To the ketone? Okay, I'll do that. Is that easier for you to retrosynthesis disconnect? So if you, if you have a diketone with R1 and R2, it's going to be hard for you, number one, to add something to that carbonyl, number one. And number two, it's going to be hard to add anything when you've got an acidic CH2 there. Right? That's going to be problematic for you. So we have a different disconnection we can use? What do you say, Vince? Can we do uh, Michael and then introduce the oxidation? Uh, Michael where? Here? Yeah. can or uh, alkyne may be difficult with the other piece so doing essentially a double Michael so cut between the carbon on R2 and the malonate carbon on R2 so we cut the double bond oh cut here yeah.
So in order to make that easier, what Steve did was do a equilibration to this one. So, Lucas, we stopped maybe prematurely here. We tautomerized here, but we also remember up here all of these are viable retrosynthetic disconnections. So, everything you see here is fine. If you wanted to stop here, you could say, all right, well, we can make that one. And then you might look in the literature. We can't use the alkyne here. Uh, and find maybe that, in that particular case, it might be difficult to make. And so the easier disconnection, in some cases, might just be to use the olefin here, where you've got the malinate adding to that simple alkyne. But all you needed to do was add water, and then it's not my problem anymore. It's not heterocycles. And you're just thinking about how to make a 1,5 uh, system. OK, how about this one? Let's do the same exact thing. So max, after I add the water, I need help. Yeah, so once you add the water, um, you can draw a tautomeric form where you reveal some symmetry around those two R groups, and it's just uh, a malinate type derivative. So you can draw the ketone. Oh, you just go straight to yeah, the ketone? Okay. The ketone. No and wasting then, time with your way past that. Okay. Um, and then that can just come from like addition into uh, alkyne. Good. This water stuff is working out well for us. Let's do it again. And uh, maybe Nick can tell us how to finish this one. Okay, I've added water. Now what do I do? Draw a different tautomer or move the olefin over? Yeah, you could retautomerize them to a similar, like, macro. Certainly viable. Is there another way to do this? So Nick made the disconnection here. No problem. That's fine. Is there another disconnection you can make? Hannah, you got another one? That was also what I was thinking. All right, fair enough. Well, what's that? Gamma. Aha! Another possibility would be here. So you could take. The advantage of that is, in certain cases, you may have ready access to the simple building block. You can do gamma deprotonation and just trap it with the simple dicarbonyl. It's an oxalate. It will work. And then treat it with acid on workup, and now pops a pyrone. So memorizing all sorts of name reactions for pyrones, when you look at the old heterocyclic books that make you do that, is a waste of your time. Instead, just add water, and then think. So that, that summarizes about a thousand papers for you. Great. Questions? Okay, how about problem of the day number three? Kumalic acid is made just by taking malic acid and heating up with acid. Is this the commercial method? This is the commercial method. Yeah, if you take malic acid and you cook it up, you will make copious quantities of kumalic acid. It's a very, very cheap compound. You want the iPad or you just want to tell me what to do? Uh, What's that? You, t you tell me? Okay. I will be your chalk servant. I'm Proceed, blind. master. I'm yes? I'm blind here, so... Okay, that's, that's the whole point. Guessing you eliminate water and make an equivalent of an accolade 
species as one partner. You know what might make your life easier, Sal? What's that? Why don't you look at the direct precursor and use the Rosetta Stone of Pyromes? Sure, so we can break that to the keystone so, and the... Let's imagine that the penultimate step looks something like... Formation of that, which then cycles, right? Right. Okay. So there's your hint. We need to get there somehow. So then you're so, not flying blind anymore. So the three carbons on the left are a decarboxylated version of the starting material, right? Three carbons on the left. One, two, three. So, so, so sorry. On the hydrated precursor you just drew. The enol carbon, the acid, and the carbon immediately above are decarboxylated starting material, more or less. Yes. I like that. And so but you haven't done a decarboxylation, have you? Sure. So the other partner needs to be decarboxylation alpha to the alcohol to make a alcohol equivalent. Okay, so we've got this. In the soup, we've potentially got some of this too. What do you want to do with it? So what you just drew adds in in a one four fashion to another partner. Is this what you want me to draw? Yeah. Okay. And Take your time. It's no rush. If you just eliminate CO2 from that, we're... I've got uh, a CO2 that can go here, that can go here, and that can go here. And where do you want me to eliminate it to? Here or here? Doesn't matter? Doesn't matter. Okay. And at that point, we've made the same intermediate as the hydrate that you drew. Sure looks like it. That's definitely possible. Can't rule it out. The great thing about this mechanism, it's uh, degenerate. Can you also imagine a pathway that would not require this and just start with here? Do we need the, do you need to eliminate to give you the, uh, the fumarate? Do you need the fumarate? You're saying that could add in a sort of more of an S2 fashion to where to displace the alcohol? Well, uh, isn't it possible that um, this itself could just act dimerize? Sure. Could you just decarboxylate the starting material? That's what we did here. Oh, okay. Okay. Yep. Or you can do this. Either one. You can draw those in a test or in an interview, you're fine as long as you can get to that product. But the key would be, if they actually threw this up on the board for you, if you do the water addition, that helps you so you're not flying blind anymore. Otherwise, it could get a little hairy. You'll get there at the end, but it may look not as pretty. Everybody happy with that? How this compound is formed, this aldehyde, or evil form of aldehyde, so, let's draw. Glad you asked that, Pavel. So, when you 
got acid around. Actually start losing carbon monoxide and water. Weird. I mean, the net is that you lose uh, overall CO2, but it's via so we've extracted a molecule CO2, but mechanistically it's via CO and water. Great question. But we took it down the fumarate path because of salt. The other one is fine. And probably when you lose your CO2 in your salt, it's probably by that too. Questions? It's an unfortunate loss of a stereo center. I mean, malic acid comes chiral, usually stereo pure. But uh, we're going to see uh, the use of cumalic acid again in just a moment, in less than 30 seconds. So this next problem comes from an actual intermediate. This was done uh, on process scale, metric ton. And uh, the intermediate here can be brought back to the bromo ester by way of a halogen metal exchange, CO2 trap, and then, uh, of course, a uh, formation of an amide and dehydration to get the nitrile. So we've got this bromo ester naphthalene. There's no heterocyclic chemistry here. Yet. What other things do you think pyrones might like to do a lot? Cycloaddition. They might like to do cycloaddition. So can you imagine a pyrone somehow embedded in that naphthalene? Yeah, I guess. You can? Yeah. Um, Tell me where. Well, I guess. Um, Oh, uh, yes, yeah. Yeah, so um, just you can remove the, I guess, the benzene ring. Get rid of the benzene ring? Yeah. And so you kind of put the uh, pattern on where the ring fusion is. Yeah, like that. And how do I make uh, cycloaddition happen with the benzene ring directly? I guess the benzene ring. Yeah. back here, luckily we have our starting material. And if we treat cumalic acid, or the methyl ester of it, methyl cumulate they call it, with bromine, that's the isomer you get out via a dibromination of this olefin, followed by a selective elimination and re-aromatization. So you take methyl cumulate, bromine gives you the bromomethyl cumulate, you then make benzene on scale that's easier to make, and then drip in your pyrone. You lose CO2, and out pops your bromo naphthalene. You, know, you should think as a thought experiment a faster way to make that, even with today's CH activation techniques. It'd be hard to compete with this in terms of cost. Okay, as a good segue into four pyrones, Let's talk about this next example, which is kind of confused. It could be either. It's pyrone fluid. So it can be either a two pyrone or a four pyrone, depending on which tautomeric form we draw. Well, the easiest way to make this is just use the standard technique we just learned. So we're just going to add water. And um, hopefully someone in Florida can tell us what to do next.
Would you like me to draw a tautomeric form there, Alex? What do you want me to do? Uh, yeah, the tautomer would, would be helpful. Okay. Disconnections? Maybe the one two bond? One two bond looks great. Good to you? Um, it'd be hard to get the anion at that position instead of the uh, the right side. Is there a solution to that? Um, I guess. Move the carboxylic acid, or I guess well, switch the polarity. Old, switch the, I mean, you can do all that, but you can also take advantage of the fact that that is a super acidic position. Someone mentioned this during a previous class. Weiler dianion. Weiler dianion. Great. So, what do we do, Hannah? How do we make a Weiler dianion? Uh, you just double deprotonate. So, okay, first acidic. equivalent is with sodium. Second equivalent is with lithium. And then that one attacks, and then you're done. Tributosic acid on workup. Are we happy? Great. Look good, Alex? Yeah. Weiler dianine. Sneaky way of protecting the melanate. And that's a great segue into four pyrones. So here are the four pyrones, the standard way of making them again. Just opening up to the, it's kind of like a perillium. And we can do the same thing for this molecule. So we can open this up. Just by adding water. Weiler dianine. Some people do that. The other thing you often see in the literature is that. So take this and deprotonate it or Weiler dianine. Either one is fine. As a reminder, all of these things represent gateway compounds to more useful nitrogen-based heterocycles. For example, the four pyrone motif can be easily converted into the dimethyl pyridine you see here. And how would you do that? So I need a set of conditions to go from A to that. And uh, maybe our pyrone leader, Shao Kun, can help us with the conditions to go from A into that uh, purity. Any any thoughts there? Uh, sorry, sorry. Ammonia. You were going to add ammonia eventually, but if I add ammonia to that pyrone now, it's just going to sit there and look at me. Uh, <coughs> the, the 
Aha! So first, some sort of methylation. So you can, what they usually use is Mirwine salt. Or some people will use methyl iodide, silver salt. So a, a fierce methylating agent will give you the perillium. Right? And then the perillium, you add ammonia. And out comes your product. Can you come up with a way of making this from earth, air, water, and fire? Maybe Tucker can help us because this is directly in his wheelhouse from problem of the day number one. Not one. You did two. Yeah. Yeah. Um. There's something here that will get us there. So, so all you need to do is focus on that. Propene in the same first reaction. Yeah. Well, uh, I don't have a methyl here. Oh. You just mean, you just say propene. Well, I'm missing an oxygen. Acetone. There's no acetone in that box. There's no acetone in that box. There's no acetone in that box. Everything you need for the answer is in the box. In the box. In the box. Boy. What's that? I mean, you can just keep randomly picking reagents. You're going to get one eventually. <laughs> There's not a lot in the box. It's not nitromethane with a C11 on it. I'll give you that clue. Let's take a hydride. Okay. That's it. So you can see your hydride PPA heated up. You will make the parent for pyrone there. We already made this intermediate. You did it before. Here it is. Well, there's acetic and hydride. If no nucleophile is around, remember you've got that, but you also have that. When you take acetic and hydride and treat it with acid, you've got two things that could potentially be used in your favor. And so if this just attacks that, you get that. And if another molecule of acetic hydride does the same exact thing to that intermediate, so this one gives you the and then another molecule of acetic hydride attacks, then cyclization, and you are done. Have you seen chemistry like this before? It's weird, right? But this is like commodity chemistry. Questions on four pyrones? Great. How about chromones or flavones? Uh, so flavones are found everywhere. I'm, I'm having flavones right now. So they're all over. You probably have them all the time. They're in food. They're in tea. Uh, a lot of drugs that have chromones in them and based on flavones. So the general ways of making these are some rather intuitive ways of doing it. Uh, the first is you can do Lorac-esque type chemistry probably going to be many of your favorite way of doing it. Uh, another way of doing this would be uh, the what's known as the Kostanecki Robinson. So you take a phenol, you do a Friedel Crafts that gives you the uh, ketone in the ortho position, and then you treat that with the acid chloride, or it could be an ester. Kostanecki Robinson is with, uh, I believe, the ester and the the other name reaction you got in some page of your hand, handout, it's an Indian one, Venkataman, something or other, is with the acid chloride. No reason to memorize all that. It's basically just Kostanecki Robinson type. And it goes presumably through the intermediacy of the O acyl intermediate, which does an intramolecular clasin, and then cyclizes. So it loses water. Uh, and then the final way of making these that's often used in the context of flavones is this Algar Flynn O Yamada. No need to memorize these name reactions. Just if you ever see it, you'll remember, hmm, I saw this in the context of a chromone before. And usually what that involves is an aldol, a Michael addition, and then some sort of oxidation. So what happens here is first you get the Michael, and then you do the epoxidation. It cyclizes, and then uh, you oxidize, or you, you lose water. Questions? Pretty standard ways of putting these together. 
So let's look at something that's more exciting. Uh, if you go to your front page of your handout, the paste and put the front page of the handout, you'll see this rather intimidating looking molecule, L8680275, straight from a pharma company. There it is. Flavopyridol, anti-cancer compound. It's OPRD paper from the late 90s. Okay, so I've gone to this retrosynthetic disconnection, which has got the uh, methoxies in place of the free phenols, and uh, now we need a logical first disconnection. So Tanner, when you see this molecule, do you have any initial thoughts? You can tell me anything about the stereochemistry, about the heterocycle, whatever you want to tell me. You're going to want, so Tanner's saying you're going to want to make the aryl piperidine? Yeah. Okay. What, uh, so what, what, what's going to be in the aryl part? Um, some nucleophile. Okay, so general thoughts we're going to need to keep in mind here from Tanner are that we're going to need some sort of... That would be electrophile. You want this to be electrophile? Sure. So... That can be a ketone, for instance? Is that what you want? Yeah. Sure. Okay. So Tanner has directed us to a viable starting material. That looks good. Great. We just have to identify a, an arene. Now, do you think uh, the appropriate aryl nucleophile for this is just to take, is just to disconnect right here? Um. Or do you want to do some? massaging to that uh, flavone first. Yeah, I guess you can you can open up the uh, perfect the flavone. Okay, brilliant. Let's do that. Let's use the disconnection we just learned 2 minutes ago. got our handy chart there that tells us Kostanecki Robinson is going to be the way to go. So that's what that disconnection gives us. Now I need a sneaky way of making that mono deprotected, which is weird. Saul was saying. So you're you're saying that you what I was saying was you wanted the trimethoxy, and then some sort of selective deprotection. So that is what I was saying, but I don't think the molecule works. And and when you have the trimethoxy system there, uh, is there something else you want to do? I mean, like for instance, it's like isolated. That sounds good. That's what I'm looking for. That gets us to this. So we all agree, let's first make the agreement that if we have that in hand, we can do an acylation. We agree on that. Now, after we have the acylation event, I need a way of selectively deprotecting that methyl in place of all the other methyls. Zeng, any thoughts on how we're going to pull that off? this intermediate here, is there something peculiar about that methyl ether that is not peculiar about these and these? 
What's special about that one? It's out of the plane. It's out of the plane. It's sticking in your nose. This one is in the plane of the board, in the plane of the board, just residing around here. This one's residing around here. But this one is sticking Pava right in the eyes. And so if you treat with sodium hydroxide, they found it cleanly deprotects there. And guess what? Once you deprotect there and you make a phenolate, you can no longer deprotect these anymore. So it just protects itself. So just cooking this thing up with hydroxide for a while gives you a clean phenolate there. Now we're almost home free because we are very close to what Tanner wanted us to start with, aren't we? Now how do I install? Now I've just got a simple Arian with a cis orientation here. What is the precursor of that? Olefin sounds good to me. And what was the conditions to go from there to there? Uh, okay, I suppose you could epoxidize and then um, maybe treat it with um, triethylsilane or something. Yeah, H minus. Sorry, sorry, say that again? I said, yeah, just some H minus. Some H minus, and then that'll give us a ketone which we need to reduce, and the reduction should take place from the opposite side of the, of the arrow, arrow. That's fine. What they actually did was hydroboration. Okay. Then oxidize and then. That's probably easier. And then, and then reduce. Question there, Max? Oh, so the oxides into the ketone after hydroperation? Yep. Okay. Oxides in the ketone, then reduce. Okay, makes sense. And then all we need to do is uh, conditions to realize Tanner's dream of uh, doing that transformation. So, how do we do that? You're going to break out your bottle of palladium? Probably not. Probably not, because you're a DuPont and you want to make metric tons of this stuff. Like, Sorry, say that again, Max? It's like Cohen's regional scale. Coleman's reagent on scale, you probably can, but then you still have to make the, you still have to use the palladium, don't you? You use trimethoxybenzene and some acid. That sounds pretty good, because trimethoxybenzene is, has a ravenous appetite for electrophiles. That thing will, will append to your finger with acid. So yeah. And acid. Done. Kilo scale, collect the money. <clears throat> Great. Questions? Okay. How about problem data number four? This is straight out of a J Med Chem paper. So it's not a figment of my imagination. Now we've got a chromone interlinked to a quinolone. We already learned about quinolones before the midterm, which feels like a long, long time ago. Cheng, any thoughts? Looks like some, some quasi-symmetry there. Ring C? Uh, okay, here's 7, 8, 9. I'll, I'll even give you a, a, a 10, 11, 12 if you want. The 
the N12 and O9. Oh, okay, I see. Um, so that leads us to, if we do that, is that right? Yeah. They do it that way. They also do it stepwise. So you can also imagine making this ring system first, and then appending on that ring system through Friedel crafts or reacting with uh, that. If you go back to this original JMED chem paper, you'll find they do the route that Cheng pr provided along with the two other possible routes where you make the chromone first, append on a quinolone, and then the quinolone first, and append on the chromo. Depends on what kind of analog series you want. This was for uh, depression. I think it was from Louis. OK. How about a medchem versus process case study? So we've got that bromine there, which is going to make all of your dreams of using palladium squash pretty quickly. Although I guess you could argue, oh, what about the iodo compound might be faster than the bromo? Sure, but um, see if you can avoid that. So just give me a thought on the simplest possible disconnection for this one. Along the lines of what we just saw. Isolation followed by aluminum chloride to get it rearranged to the ortho position. And then once you've got this in hand, the base and the oxalate will get you the product. The med chemist did something a little bit different, but still along the lines of everything you learned in the box there. The one depicted here does not cyclize. One of them does. And they were unable to get the thing to equilibrate to give the correct one. So for the med chemist, it's a super quick way of doing this, far better than doing your Friedel crafts followed by cyclization. Because this one is dump and stir and be happy with your 30% yield. Is that clear? make coumarins, the next heterocycle we need to cover. So a few different ways of making these. Uh, one of them is the Perkin, which involves taking it, this is the most widely used way of doing it. You take your phenol, you use Vilsmeyer reagent, let's say you formulate it, or you can do direct demethylation, DMF, formulate it, then take that formal species and react it with a ester. We'll do an aldol followed by cyclization. There's an old style one, which is a Peckman, which we will review in a minute because it's very analogous to what we saw in the quinolone, quinolone synthesis world. So you take your dicarbonyl with phenol, cook it up, and 
if you have a problem with regional selectivity, people often take the O directing group, like a mom, lithiate, and then add in a Michael fashion, addition elimination, followed by cyclization. Finally, there's an interesting paper from Trost many years ago where they take phenols and directly, it's a form of uh, CH activation, just a functionalization. So let's take a look at Fraxinol on the front page of your handout. So here's Fraxinol. Fraxinol just comes from the corresponding trimethoxyphenol, the alkyne, and palladium. One pot. Well, those are the ways of making coumarins, which brings us to the last and final problem of the day. Calanolite A. So if you look at the front page of your handout, there it is on the screen. A pretty diabolical molecule that nature made specifically for the purpose of the today's class. So we cleared out the stereo centers in the ring A to make your life a little bit easier. And now we need some thoughts on uh, which one you might want to disconnect first, second, third, what methods you might want to use to make these various things. Uh, but almost nothing you say uh, will be useless. I can use almost everything. thing you have to do, it's just a small trivial detail, um, is, is, is just tell us where, um, but that's most of the problem. You can use trimethoxybenzene, or you can also use a uh, fluoroglucinol, which is just the deep protective version of Chang's starting material. The way to sort of think about this problem is which heterocycle upon its installation would perturb the rest of the CH bonds in such a way that it would enable you to <coughs> regioselectively functionalize the rest? So that's the, the logic and strategy you want to apply to a difficult system like this. Otherwise, you're going to be lost, right? Because you're thinking, well, why, why should I disconnect B before C or A before B? None of it really makes any sense. So because we have to install stereo centers at the end, maybe it makes the most sense to put A in at the end. And then that gives us a choice between C and B. So if we put B in first before we put C, do you think that's going to help us on differentiating the remaining CH bonds? <coughs> Any thoughts on that, Sarah? So I guess the strategic decision we have to make is, does it look better to you, Sarah, to have this type of compound as an intermediate? versus like which one do you think is going to be more differentiable retrosynthetically and moving forward 
between those two because that's going to guide your disconnection strategy. Yeah, that sounds great. Ah, uh, yeah, that sounds great. We've got a sort of electronic direction here. This this uh, auction can't donate as well, so we may get regislectivity preferences between Friedel crafts here and here. And we've got some uh, you know steric blocking as well. Whereas this one, this O is still pretty good directing group, and so you're probably going to have challenges in the Friedel crafts as well as the problem. Under strongly acidic conditions of a free crash, you've got this annoying olive in there, too. So probably our best bet is to first take our fluoroglucinol and make A, just using a Peckman. So you just take fluoroglucinol that dicarbonyl acid, and you get out A. Now that we have A in hand, they use an interesting reaction that was invented by Derek Barton for making pyrans. If you take this tertiary alcohol and you heat it up with pyridine at 170 degrees, product that pops out is the benzopyrin. issue with this is if you do this reaction on that intermediate, you don't get good selectivity. So what do we need to do to improve this is first and then two or that gives us that with perfect selectivity. So let's take this slow. First, when we take this intermediate A and we do the Friedel crafts, we get selectivity to go only here. Why? Well, Sarah just taught us. We've deactivated this position. This one has a direction here and here, but this one doesn't direct very well para. And so presumably you've got some electronic preference get pushing here and here towards that position. So we get perfect selectivity in the Friedel craft. We then cook it up with the tertiary alcohol, the Barton reaction. We get that benzopyrin in, in place. That presumably goes to the tertiary carbocation followed, followed by a Friedel craft, so high temperature. And then with this compound in hand, we can easily forge the final ring system just with acid aldehyde. And then exhaustive reduction to give us the ring A. Selectivity is high? Selectivity is only one, apparently, according to this paper. And the strategic insight is first putting in this ring system before the benzo pyrin. So the coumarin first, followed by the benzo pyrin. Now, how are you supposed to approach this on a test? Well, the key is that you've got all the tools you need to propose. Chang started us off, immediately recognized what the starting material is. And then once you've got the starting material in hand, you just use all these named reactions to put them in the proper order. Had you gone and made A first and C, probably it would have worked on a test. You could have muddled your way to the product. This is what they finally did. Of course, hindsight's always 20-20. There's no way to tell you to memorize this kind of strategy. But with, you've got all the strategies you need in order to 
put a compound like this together. And then the order is something you may need to either empirically find or may take you a few hours of careful thought. But a first retrosynthetic disconnection on that, if you saw something like that on a test, should now be pretty easy. Questions? It's as hard as it gets in the Coumarin world, folks. <clears throat> How about this alpha beta integrin antagonist? Uh, there's no heterocycle here, but there probably once was. Why not just make it from cell cell, right? Because that wouldn't involve a heterocycle. <laughs> it's a really <laughs> succinct way to make it. <laughs> Yes, and uh, if um, they cover that in classics or in Boger's class, you should make that suggestion. <laughs> but I, I need I need a heterocycle starting material, preferably one that involves something we're talking about right now. That sounds pretty good, there, Tanner. Isocoumarins, the final heterocycle we have to talk about today. So isocoumarins, again, you can use a palladium strategy, but the palladium strategy can be derailed at any moment if your regional selectivity is not right. So you need to be pay careful attention to your R and R prime in order to get those right. Uh, the other one is just, as we've been doing over and over and over again, add water, get you to an intermediate like this, which you can imagine making through some sort of either deprotonation here or maybe palladium arylation there. But this is usually going to be acidic enough that you can add in some deprotonate, use a directing group here, deprotonate there, to make that possible. Hey, Phil. Yeah, what do you say, Alex? What about the stereo center in the integrant antagonist? Uh, I believe they're just resolving. Oh, OK. Yeah. I mean, that goes to the point of still the, the top three ways of making chiral centers in the industry are going to be resolution, if it's cheap enough, um, enzymatic, or hydrogenation. It's 99% of it, pretty much. Uh, maybe before we move forward, it's good to have a quick reminder to point out the similarities and differences between when we learned how to make quinolo uh, quinolones and also um, coumarins. So really quick, does anybody remember what happened with this? This, this is back way before the midterm. Get the two methyl for the top one? Yeah. Is that right? Other way around. Oh, psh. So this one you heat and then treat with acid. Um, so that is going to give you other indeed. Remember we discussed this: the thermodynamic versus the kinetic. So the heat and then H plus form the amide first, then cyclides. The bottom one, H plus, you form that vanilligous amide first, then cyclides when you heat it. You don't like it? It's good. We're good? Okay. If we take phenol and we do the same thing, but slightly different conditions, one of them is acid and the other one is P2O5, which is a great desiccant. Chang, what do you think with the acid? Same diketone.
passive condition, the key to be put in the default position, like the DOM or the federal. Is this what you want? I guess. So, I want it the other way around. Saul wants it the other way around? Yeah, what we should do is maybe take a vote. Um, so let's see if this will be A and this will be B. Let's put what Cheng said here, and then let's put the other option there. And um, so everybody that's happy with A here, you, you want to raise your hand? Cheng, clearly. Uh, but every one of the people in the audience has abandoned you. And then who wants uh, this structure for A? Everyone else. Okay. Well, it turns out that, yeah, uh, <coughs> this one gives this one, and that one gives that one. So when you treat this with a desiccant, you form uh, the vanilligous ester first. P2O5 just extracts water, and then with acid, you form. The, you do a transesterification first, followed by cyclization. But I guess the rule of thumb there is that you, you, know, you should know that there are conditions you can use to get either regiochemistry. That's the key. OK, great. In the last few minutes, we'll cover these uh, last couple of examples because they are good uh, portrayals of what you can do with an isocoumarin in synthesis. This is an angiotensin compound, and I think this is another very large scale example. Uh, so the first example takes this dimethoxybromobenzene we treat with LDA, which are good conditions to generate benzyne. Then we got benzyne in the presence of a malonate anion. So what is going to happen there? Well, we can imagine an addition and then an attack there. Got your medicinal dye substitution. We saponify and then treat that with acetic and hydride. And uh, look what pops out. It's a tautomeric form of an isocoumarin, essentially. I draw it with this being aromatic here, I've got an isocoumarin. Now when I take the isocoumarin and treat it with triethylamine in acetonitrile and that acid chloride, out pops that product on pretty large scale. So do you suspect with triethylamine the isocoumarin or isocoumarone would exist in that, in that form? What do you think, Steve? Is it going to be like that? Uh, probably not. Okay. What would you think it looks like? The enol form. Okay. And then what happens? And then with triethylamine, you're probably going to form PT. Still need to get here somehow. And then from here, you could probably form an enol again. And that will close down. And then I 
suppose there's a decarboxylation to reform aromaticity. Is that the intermediate one, Steve? Look at that. That's that. Thanks, Steve. Well, because of Steve, it looks like we might be able to put a couple of minutes back in the bank because all we have to do is talk about this one final product here. Fidoxosin is a marvelous prequel till tomorrow's lecture because I'm only going to tell you how you make one piece of it. So if you look at the front page of your handout on Fidoxosin, it can be brought up brought back into two pieces. We haven't learned yet how to make pyrimidines. We will soon. But pyrimidines can be made by this type of 5 plus 1 approach, as we'll call it later, where the isocyanate adds in here, and then a cyclization takes place. You can get out your product. We'll learn how to make V tomorrow, because tomorrow we cover all of the diazines. That means the pyridazines, the pyrazines, and the pyrimidines. All of the things you've been waiting for are coming tomorrow. So we'll learn that tomorrow. This one, though, comes from this intermediate. And the faster you can get me this retrosynthetic disconnection, the more minutes get returned to you. Dong Min, any clue? Some kind of what? That's some kind of coumarin. Now what do I do? Three plus two, says Hannah. That sounds great. And if this is a chiral group here, let's say it's derived from the chiral group where R is equal to phenyl, that amine is super cheap. And so one can derive this azomethine illid, do the cycloaddition, get pretty good DR. I think get up to like five or four to one, which they can crystallize up. And then just a simple reduction of the resulting lactone intermediate. And they've got a scalable way to make this stuff. Questions? That's perfect. And so uh, TA, they're going to get like nine minutes back. I'm already over 20, so I'm only over 11 now, right? So tomorrow, uh, we will now have another whirlwind. It should be more exciting tomorrow because, you know, pyrones are not very... It's hard to make things seem exciting, but tomorrow, that's like, uh, it gets as exciting as it gets, okay? So we'll see you for diazines.
this deactivates power stronger than the uh, other base force. Uh, That's the hypothesis. They don't offer much of an explanation. That's sort of best. 